All right, folks, make your way back in, please. This gets progressively more and more difficult to get people to come back. The cowbell loses its some effectiveness. I'm a big believer that we need a sheepdog, but I don't have one, so. But we'll see what we got. All right. We need a thunderstorm outside, I think, is what we really need. But all right, then I'm going to start in. So, so the format for this final panel is I've asked each of the panelists to take a couple minutes, whether that's five or ten or three or seven or who knows, but take a couple minutes and share some of their thoughts that are based on or at least inspired by the, the suite of issues that we've talked about here. Um, you know, but I haven't given them very specific marching orders, but I will tell you a little bit about why I invited each of them, which gives you at least a hint of, of topics I, some of the reasons, uh, some of the things I think they'll cover. Um, let me start in order here with Larry. Larry McDonald is an attorney, consultant, um, he's, he's been an adjunct professor here. Um, he's also the person who was the first director of the Natural Resources Law Center, which was the predecessor of the Getches Wilkinson Center. So Larry really started this tradition of the June Water Conference, where I think the first one was 1980. Does, do you know by chance? Okay. So we've been doing this a while. Um, Larry did it for an awful long time. Now I've done it for an awful long time. So uh, uh, maybe I should hand it off to someone. But uh, Larry's interests in the Colorado are very diverse. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what he's going to talk about, and I kind of like that. So we're going to we're going to start with Larry. Um, then we'll go with Don Osler, who is the executive director of the Upper Colorado River Commission. And as you've undoubtedly noticed, we've we've spent a day talking about initiatives in the Lower Basin, and we've heard from representatives in the Lower Basin who are involved in those things. Um, but we haven't had an explicit Upper Basin perspective. So I'll, have, I'll ask Don to do that. And then beyond that, again, uh, talk about whatever he wants to talk about. Um, after that, we'll do, go to Carl, Carl Flessa, who's a professor of geosciences at the University of Arizona. Um, but he's the co-chief scientist for the Minute 319 monitoring program for the Delta. Um, so, um, you know, the pulse flow looked amazing, but Carl's this guy who can tell you what it did or did not actually accomplish in terms of ecological um, recovery. So that, I would assume, is at least part of what Carl will cover today. Um, Steve Mummy is a political scientist just up the road at, at Colorado State. Um, he's been writing for years about transboundary water management, a lot of US, US Mexico issues. Um, but I've never worked with him, I don't think, and never Never had him at one of these conferences, so I thought this would be the opportunity. Um, Dennis Lettenmeyer is a professor at UCLA, known for his work on, on hydrologic modeling and with the real, how can I say this? Dennis was the person whose, Dennis's work was the, really the first work that, that got me thinking about how, how you think about climate how that can really tip the scales about what management regimes can work in, in the Colorado and which ones can't. I mean, the climate is such an incredibly important variable, and I think we all appreciate that now, but uh, he, he figured that out a lot sooner than most of us. Um, and finally, Allison Harvey Turner is here because the, the philanthropic world has become a big player in the Colorado River, and it wasn't always that way. Um, for people like myself that, that live off of grant funding, I'm glad to, glad this is, things have evolved this way. Um, she's been very helpful in, 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 in helping me um, connect this event to the philanthropic world and getting a little sponsorship money and that sort of thing to this, from the philanthropic world. So um, that's all very helpful. So again that's part of what i guess that's part of your mandate but then just go off in any direction you want to go off and then um, hopefully we have a diverse enough group here with a diverse enough set of remarks that 
moving the conversation forward beyond that will be easy. That's the hope. All right, so we will start with Larry. And you can come up here if you want, Larry, but there's no, certainly no need. All right, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Doug, and uh, nice to be here. As Doug said, I've been you know, kind of sitting in, in these meetings uh, going way back, and uh, so I'm kind of proud and happy that I can still get here a little harder than it used to be for me, but at least I'm still here, so that's good news. So great, great panels uh, this morning and this afternoon. I think, you know, there's just no doubt that the efforts underway in uh, the lower basin, uh, including Mexico, are terrific, hardworking, heroic efforts. The, 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 pro the progress that has been made is, is impressive. Uh, the commitment that we see being displayed by all parties is really extraordinary. Uh, you know, as someone who's been kind of watching these issues for a long time, uh, it is so rewarding to see the leadership in the basin uh, taking the, the responsibility to, to really lead us through some pretty difficult times. And I don't think there's anything more challenging than shortage of water in uh, uh, the Western water system. And we've had that ongoing for 17, going on 18 years, and we are still doing really well overall. That, that speaks really well to the people that have been uh, working so hard to uh, keep this going. Uh, so, uh, you know, what, what I want to say is a little like, uh, you know, what John Ensimir said this morning, it's not that um, the, the efforts that are ongoing aren't absolutely essential. They are, and, and the, the, the things that are being done uh, are also uh, really important towards bringing uh, us to a place where there's a little more security uh, of water use in the lower basin and in the upper basin because we are a connected, we are a connected system. Uh, but I thought that I would take my five minutes to sort of throw a little bit of a different wrinkle into the story uh, and, and see just whether it isn't worth us uh, sometimes kind of thinking a little bit differently. What uh, you know, I've observed since the 80s working on Colorado River issues is that we work, we work as people have said, very incrementally. And we spend enormous times in prolonged negotiations, the product of which is very prescriptive, detailed outcomes. <clears throat> Those are, are focused very specifically on what is the immediate short-term problem and how to get past that problem. Uh, so today, what we are focused on is the elevation in Lake Mead and how we keep that elevation from going below that level at which shortage is declared, and that is an honorable and important objective. Uh, but it reminds me very much of sort of what our kind of standard modus is. You know, we get a fix on what we think is going to get us through the next 10 years, and we do that. That's where we kind of focus our efforts, and we go through a very complicated process of negotiating all the different pieces that have to be negotiated because this is a very interconnected system. Uh, and then we get something, and it holds us for a few years, and we feel pretty good, and then, you know, things progress. And then we find that really wasn't uh, the, 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 the solution that we hoped it would be, or at least it was only a temporary solution. So I'm not going to suggest that I have the ultimate solution, but what I did want to lay on the table was something that, you know, seems to me is worth discussing. We, we don't, we haven't, but I would say that we should. Uh, and that is the need for some uh, voluntary retirement of consumptive use in the lower basin. Now, of course, I can say this because I'm an academic and I'm retired, so, you know, and, and it's in the lower basin, and so, you know, it's all risk-free to me. Uh, but you saw the math that Terry Fult talked about uh, this morning, the structural deficit. That is uh, irrefutable. Uh, my numbers are a little different than Terry's, but it doesn't really matter uh, what is true is that in the foreseeable future, there will not be enough physical water available in the lower basin if the uses and the losses continue at the level that they have historically. And what we've seen, and I think this is really a, a wonderful uh, response by the lower basin users, is some very good management of water, some reduction of existing consumptive uses to help bring us closer into balance. Um, but it's temporary. It's short term. It's still based on what I think uh, John Ensinger talked about is hope. Hope that we're going to wait a little bit longer and somehow the weather cycles are going to go back to what they used to be and gee, you know, we will get that surplus flow after all and life will be good again. 
Uh, and in the meantime, you know, we've dodged that next, that next bullet. Uh, and and I, I understand that thinking. I, I, you know, know that that's human nature, and there's nothing at all wrong with that. In fact, it's kind of remarkable how well they've done. Uh, but the, the fact remains that, you know, we have this um, a basic shortfall of water that does not appear to me to be fixable in any way other than beginning to address the oversubscription of the honest water supply that the basin has. So. Can we think about a, about a parallel strategy, not one that displaces what's ongoing, because we still need all of the work that is being talked about here, <clears throat> but perhaps uh, alongside of that, begin to talk about is there interest in some voluntary retirement of consumptive use on a for pay basis uh, that we could set goals and say, here's what we're after, we'd like to achieve, we don't know if that's possible, but uh, you know, here, here's what we're thinking. Uh, one of the ways you could sort of measure that is uh, in the allocations that were made in the Colorado River Compact, there was no accounting for evaporation or river losses in the process of allocating the water to the lower basin. It just wasn't taken into account, and there were good reasons for it. In, in 1922, the, the Pula River still actually flowed into uh, the Colorado River. Uh, there was plenty of water coming from the upper basin. There really didn't seem to be the need to kind of account for the evaporation and the river losses, but of course, that's no longer that's no longer the case. So if you just focus <clears throat> on that source of loss, and, and what your objective is is to keep intact um, more or must, much much of the consumptive uses that exist, uh, then you could sort of look at that portion of the water supply, and that's you know probably 600,000, maybe 700,000 acre feet uh, of water. Uh, but I, I didn't decide to sort of set that as my goal. I think um, we could do something a little bit less than that. And let me use an example here. Australia, you know, in their Murray-Darling system, which is often compared to the Colorado, uh, went through a very prolonged drought, which the parties all acknowledged that the, the, the river system was oversubscribed, that there was really no uh, conceivable way to meet the different goals that the basin had. <clears throat> with the existing water uses, and the, the federal government stepped up with a program uh, that provided uh, actually billions of dollars to acquire water rights, entitlements, in the Murray-Darling basis and retire them and basically leave that water uh, in stream. So they uh, started this in 2007. It was a 10-year program. Um, they, by uh, just a couple, about about a month ago, they had already retired about 2.3 million acre feet of water use in the basin at a cost of about $1,500 per megaliter, which, uh, you know, is uh, way cheaper than we could do it, but that's what they've spent. Uh, but, you know, they, they have more money and they're continuing to do this, but they've had that kind of success in reducing the demand for water in, in that system. Uh, what I'm kind of envisioning is maybe we could set a, a target of, say, 500,000 uh, acre feet of consumptive use retirement. <clears throat> I'm just kind of uh, imagining now, but let's, let's say it was $1,000 an acre foot we had to pay to uh, acquire that water, and of course the prices would vary all over the, the basin. Uh, it's a lot of money. $500,000, $500 million is a lot of money, but I think there would be a lot of different sources of support for this. And, and uh, if we did it perhaps as a pilot project just to test the market to see if there's interest, we, we might figure out whether this is a worthwhile strategy. This, as I say, could happen parallel to what's going on otherwise. Um, what would happen? Um, consumptive uses would cease. That water would stay in Lake Mead. Uh, that water would effectively replace the evaporation losses that today exist in, in that uh, lake. Should the good days return, that water is potentially available for release down to the Gulf, the Mexican Delta that we heard about earlier. Uh, in other words, it could be a way for us to also help address some of our environmental concerns in, in Mexico because in, in essence, <clears throat> this water was it would be system water and it could be used for environmental purposes so long as uh, there was sufficient water to replace it. All right, uh, it would be important though that no new depletions um, occur. Will it work? You know, of course we don't know, but uh, my wish is that we would give it a try and see if it's uh, something that might help. Uh, my sense is that uh, it, it is perhaps the only real way to get us into a longer term balance in the lower basin, uh, an important removal of a big chunk of that structural deficit that not only would help uh, solidify those existing water uses that, that today are continuing to be important in the lower basin, 
It would help to minimize the draw from the upper basin that we feel uh, every year. So that's my five minutes worth. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to be here as well. I've really enjoyed the uh, comments and the talks that have been given so far. Uh, I've heard a lot of things that uh, have caused me to think. I always appreciate Terry Folk's uh, arithmetic and mathematics, uh, and especially his modeling. Uh, but he, he did say something was true. Uh, all, you, all you have to do in this basin is identify something that's not likely to happen, and don't make any plans for it, and it probably will happen. Uh, that was very true with an item in the interim guidelines that the upper basin particularly disliked, but uh, Terry's arithmetic and mathematics showed us that there was only about a 3% chance this could occur, and lo and behold, it occurred the first year after the agreement was signed. So when Terry says something, believe him. Uh, I also learned uh, that the upper basin was uh, flat-footed uh, with regards to responding to the interim guidelines or to the lower basin DCP. We'll talk about that a little bit, but my arches are actually pretty good. Uh, <laughs> the, upper, <laughs> the upper Colorado River Commission uh, is a interstate water administrative agency in the upper basin really serves the four states of Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, and Utah. Uh, we have a federal uh, chair on our commission in addition to four governor's representatives. And unlike the lower basin, uh, Terry's counterpart in the upper basin is not the water master. The uh, Upper Colorado River Commission was given that responsibility when Congress approved the upper basin compact in 1948. So with that, I ought to uh, also uh, provide a little disclaimer. Uh, I am not here uh, representing the views of the Upper Colorado River Commission. Uh, the views that I express are my own views and should not be taken as such. And that's probably the main reason that I don't have a PowerPoint today. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is the, it seemed odd to me that uh, a bunch of individuals would gather to talk about the uh, blueprint for sustainability in the lower basin. And I look around and I, here I am from the upper basin and I'm going to, uh, as much as I would like to, uh, tell the lower basin what to do to be sustainable, I know that those water managers in the lower basin who sit in that hot seat, who work on these things every single day, uh, are very, very knowledgeable about what they need to do to sustain the uses in the lower basin. And I trust that, and I am not going to tell them what to do. But I am going to uh, indicate with regards to their plans if I see a uh, effect on the upper basin where uh, I either disagree with, and that I, I guess that's the bulk of my, my comments. So. Uh, let me just mention why is lower basin sustainability even important to the upper basin? It used to be in years past that the saying, what happens in the lower basin stays in the lower basin, or maybe that was Las Vegas. Uh, that used to be true, but it is not anymore, especially since the interim guidelines were adopted in 2007 by all seven states. Uh, what happens at Lake Mead affects the operation of Lake Powell. What happens in the lower basin affects the water use in the upper basin. We're tied together through something called coordinated reservoir operations, and that's part of the interim guidelines. So it's very much, the upper basin is very much an affected stakeholder to the lower basin sustainability issue. Uh, so with that, maybe let's get started. Uh, I think I need to, uh, right off the bat, indicate one of the things that uh, will affect lower basin sustainability is that there's growth in the upper basin. That's one of the fastest growing regions of the country, and it isn't going to stop. And the upper basin has plans to develop additional water. Uh, we know at this stage that we likely will never receive the water promised in the 22 compact. We'll always be for forever shorted. These are my words. Maybe not all of my upper basin cohorts would agree. But we'll always be forever shorted over what was promised in the compact. 
we know that we have to look at the river and determine what is the safe yield so that when we do use the water that we, we don't overuse it to the point where we have a crisis. And we're fortunate that our growth has been slower than the lower basin, so we've had time. We've had time to experience this last 17 years of drought, and we have additional time. But we do believe that there is some additional water that can be and will be developed in the upper basin. So the growth in the upper basin, additional development in the upper basin, along with what happens with, with climate, all of those things together are going to mean uh, less frequent, uh, uh, releases of extra water to the lower basin and smaller magnitude releases of water to the lower basin. You heard Terry indicate that the lower basin really has existed on uh, surplus flows. And those in the future you can assume will be somewhat going away. Uh, I, I heard the whistle. Was that you telling me to stop? Okay. It <laughs> must have been a phone. Uh, I want to make sure I don't run over too much, but uh, with regards to the lower basin DCP, uh, I, d I don't want to let the, uh, the flat-footed comment pass. Uh, the upper basin, we don't view ourselves as delaying the lower basin DCP. Uh, that was a, a uh, uh, policy that was developed by the lower basin. It really had to be developed by them to negotiate the very difficult things but the upper basin received a pretty, pretty well-baked cake. And it contained provisions that were not entirely acceptable to us relative to modification of the interim guidelines and, and the, the effect on the law of the river. And so we have been uh, negotiating and trying to uh, adjust that lower basin DCP so that it was something that we could also live with. They're also scrutinizing the upper basin uh, drought contingency plan to protect elevations in Lake Powell from a very similar standpoint. I view that as normal and uh, would I, I can't see how the process would happen any different uh, uh, based upon the procedure for development of the lower basin DCP. But I applaud the lower basin managers for their uh, stepping forward and the commitment to conserve additional water be able to retain that water in Lake Mead. That is extremely important. Uh, my, my biggest complaint is, the, is how long it's taking, taken and our desire to see things uh, happen quicker. But that's a very heavy lift, we recognize. But with regards to the DCP, uh, the upper basin perspective is that it is not going to be enough for the future. Uh, as I mentioned before, the lower basin and the upper basin are connected through coordinated reservoir operations. And we view the lower basin DCP as being an effective plan to avoid those critical low reservoir elevations that were talked about that, that would be a disaster if we hit. But also the lower basin plan, uh, the additional contribution to kick in at fairly low levels of the reservoir. So Lake Mead's fairly low before it kicks in. And then those contributions help bail it out and avoid hitting the real low elevations. But then they can be taken back uh, when reservoir con conditions improve, but, but far from a full, full reservoir. And it, it's our view that that plan in the long run will be effective in what the lower basin wants to do. But it generally will mean Lake Mead will continue to ride fairly low, maybe not crashing to those critical levels. And, and it may not be able to uh, recover fully with the withdrawal of uh, conserved water. So Lake Mead uh, going forward in a relatively low state means with the interim guidelines and coordinated reservoir operations, additional re releases from Lake Powell. Uh, when Lake Mead is really low and Powell has more water, oftentimes we release 9 million acre feet instead of the normal release, which has been 8.23 million acre feet. And so on the long term, uh, continuing with uh, more than half the time at 9 million acre feet releases is a, is a concern to the upper basin. In the short term, it's a very good strategy and step forward. We hope it can be used to gain experience, both for us and for the lower basin, and to uh, begin to look at what additional measures, if any, need to be taken. 
but the assumption that the interim guidelines will continue if the modeling shows more than half the time releasing 9 million acre feet is not a good, not a good assumption and would be an, an issue for us. Uh, maybe seeing that my time is uh, rapidly gone, uh, I just want to mention the uh, uh, Me Mexican Minute 32X. Uh, Mexico's a long way from the upper basin. But again, they are a stakeholder on the river. Their contributions are in magnitude much smaller than what the lower basin will contribute. But they do have an effect. We heard from uh, Commissioner Drusina that uh, their contributions may have been in large part what held Lake Mead from hitting shortage levels uh, recently. So even that small amount was critical and important. Uh, we are anxious to see that agreement completed. We think that the sustainability of the system demands Mexico to be at the table as a stakeholder. And we think that it demands Mexico to begin to shoulder some of the burdens of sustainability. We think that the process that has been used in Minute 32X, that Mexico has been educated immensely about the system being more of a bystander in the past, just expecting their one and a half million acre feet every year and not participating in the, the problems and the, and, and the difficulties in administering the, the water of the Colorado River Basin. But I, I am confident at this point from conversations with Commissioner Salmon that Mexico desires to step up and be a full stakeholder, including for taking in some of the uh, not so easy things that will need to be done in the future to maintain sustainability. So we're anxious to see that completed. We're anxious to see some temporary solutions and language in the lower basin DCP that would allow us to uh, negotiate and execute an agreement with Mexico uh, as a contingent minute, waiting still for the lower basin to be able to get their DCP through the rigorous approvals that they have to go through. Likewise, the upper basin is wanting to accelerate our upper basin drought contingency plan. We think we're quite close to being able to have that plan where we want it to be. And we think the combination of all these efforts are important, but uh, they do see the need for something more in the future. And maybe I will rest with that. Hi everybody! Thanks for uh, thanks for being here, and I appreciate the invitation. And I really learned a lot this morning. Uh, and, and in the early afternoon session, I'm going to speak to some of those those issues as we go by. Uh, we've seen several photos of the uh, of the Colorado River uh, upstream of where I usually work in in the Delta. I wanted to make sure you. I mean, how do I forward this? On the side. Yeah, the upper part of the side. There we go. That's the Colorado River in a large part of the Delta. Um, I wanted to sort of, however, be more optimistic about things. There we go. Here comes the Colorado River. Uh, this is, of course, uh, during the pulse flow. And one of the big lessons of the pulse flow is uh, how the back here is it's sort of how, this is something that the uh, conservation NGOs really learned how to do. Uh, with a little bit of water, but a lot of care, a lot of landscaping, and a lot of planting, an enormous amount of habitat restoration can be done. This is before. This is during. This is only uh, five months after the flow. This is 27 months after the flow. Some of the cottonwoods and willows that germinated during the pulse flow are now more than 15 or 20 feet tall. It's really quite remarkable what you can do with a, with a very long growing season and a little bit of water and a lot of care. So everybody's learning how to use water very efficiently for habitat restoration. One of the things that's really come out also in the presentations uh, today is that habitat restoration is much more than just about birds, fish, and trees. It's about people, and people are extraordinarily important to this whole enterprise. And we've heard, for example, with regard to salt and sea efforts, the importance of public health, uh, recreational values have come to the fore, 
as Jennifer showed in some of her slides, and as Governor Lewis pointed out, the cultural and spiritual values of water in restoration are also extraordinarily important. So we need to obviously think more about restoration well beyond birds, fish, and trees. The other thing that sort of occurred to me as I was sitting through some of the presentations this morning is I've sort of now identified for myself at any rate, there are four ends to the, con to the Colorado River, the four sort of terminations as it were. One of them, of course, is the Salton Sea. Uh, one of them, of course, is the area where in which I work, the Colorado River Delta. Another is the area in which we, we haven't had any representatives from here today, but it's sort of the end of the river in the US, uh, the Lower Colorado River Multi-Species Conservation Plan, where there's active restoration efforts going on. And then what I also learned today is about the Gila River Indian community uh, and their restorations uh, of the Gila River. And I was really impressed that what basically is happening is they're taking water from the Colorado River through the CAP, that is, they're pumping it uphill, and restoring a reach of the Gila River with Colorado River water. That's fantastic. <laughs> it was really great. So, but in, in, in talking about restoration, uh, it seemed to me there are, there are three what I'll call limiting factors. Actually, there's four. I really should start out here with the number one is, is commitment. And we've seen a lot of sort of efforts, the results of commitment uh, here in the presentations today. But of course, one of the limiting factors is water but everybody's learning how to use water very, very efficiently in restoration. One of them, of course, is money. Let's not be uh, uh, shy about that. And one of them, of course, is talent, uh, sort of the people on the ground and both the commitment of their, of, to the effort and the skills that they bring to bear on restoration efforts. So let's think about talent for a minute and, and thinking about those four ends of the river, especially the one that I'm, I'm involved with. You know, the talent comes in with sort of what I'll call ecological engineering. How do you move the water? How do you make sure the ground how do you make sure the groundwater is in the right place at the right time? You know the implementation of engineering knowledge, and one of the things that I suspect is not as well done as it should be is knowledge sharing among those four ends of the river. Uh, there's not nearly as much I'd say conversations going on among the people who are implementing these restoration efforts in those four ends of the river, and we could probably do a lot better. Uh, were those conversations happening. The other aspect of talent here are science needs. And it's at this point I'll comment on something that most of you probably know, is that scientists, especially academic scientists, are eager to tell you what it is you should be doing. Uh, it's time, obviously, to, to reverse that particular equation. And one of the things I hope comes up uh, when we get into the discussion part of this is a little bit of audience participation. I'd be interested in finding out from the people in the audience what you would like to know from the scientists. Because after all, we're trying to put science to work here. My last comment is because Doug asked us to sort of speak to this issue of sustainability, and many of us have, and many of us have avoided it. Um, I'll sort of, sort of speak around it a little bit. Um, sustainability is, uh, you know, defined in, in perhaps too many ways, but I'd say that one thing about sustainability, if you say, well, sustainability means we can just keep doing what we've always been doing, um, that's, so the answer is, is the river sustainable? I'd say no, uh, for obvious reasons, we're running out of water, uh, so we have to change some of our practices. Another reason sustainability is not here yet is the status quo is really not quite acceptable yet. And there really isn't enough habitat restoration going on. There isn't enough acknowledgement of the legitimate needs of water for both the environment and for the people who use the environment. And the other reason we're probably not at sustainability yet is it's a moving target. We've heard a lot of people talk about, well, when the drought is over, folks, the new normal may not look like the old normal. So we don't know what the status quo in terms of the amount of water available is going to be. So if somebody said, you know, uh, are we on the road to sustainability? I'd say no. We might be able to see the road from here, but we're definitely not on the road to sustainability as yet. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> uh, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Doug, for inviting me. I just want to make a correction. I was here about uh, 10 years ago, and uh, at that time I was giving a paper on 
uh, the prospects for groundwater cooperation along the U.S.-Mexican border. <laughs> um, many years ago, as a political scientist, I made a very dangerous uh, uh, prediction. It's always dangerous to predict as a political scientist. Uh, but uh, the prediction was there would never be a groundwater treaty between the United States and Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thus far, that prediction still uh, <laughs> uh, is valid. Uh, and uh, but it kind of gets to uh, uh, what I want to uh, talk about uh, here, because I think when we talk about sustainability on the Colorado River, um, uh, we have to acknowledge that we have uh, two big structural deficits. <laughs> the first one you've heard a lot about today, uh, and that is uh, the, the, the disparity between water rights and water entitlement and water availability, what Mother Nature actually provides on the Colorado River. Uh, and that's a serious matter. Uh, and as Carl just said, we don't know what's going to, what's going to happen, uh, but we certainly need to be planning uh, for the persistence of that structural deficit uh, on, on the Colorado uh, River. Um, and that gets us to the other deficit, which is the, the institutional governance deficit on the Colorado River. <clears throat> and that's a story in two parts. Uh, the first part of that story uh, is uh, the uh, Colorado River Compact and everything that ha has sprung from it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because, uh, because that was a, a story about uh, fixing rights and, and fixing uh, allocations uh, on, the, on the Colorado River uh, among the seven basin states. And that's a very important and, and extraordinary and epic undertaking uh, that, uh, that produced many benefits uh, for the United States and for the, for the Colorado River Basin, uh, with, with, without a, a doubt. Uh, but it was uh, premised on, uh, on a kind of uh, rights-based assertion of what people were entitled to, what people would get, and what people have. Um, uh, it was not very flexible. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that we're dealing with now, huh? uh, is that we don't have enough Flexibility. So the governance problem in in, in uh, the area of the compact, I think, uh, is is an ongoing uh, dilemma uh, for uh, both the upper basin and, and, and the lower basin states, in trying to figure out how to how to to deal with uh, persistent drought and how to deal with scarcity uh, over the long term. And we are making progress there. <laughs> uh, the, the the good news, uh, we're nowhere near sustainability. But we've begun a, begun a process with the DCP, with the, with the Salton Sea uh, Agreement, with, the, with, with the Minute 32X, three, three uh, to try and, and deal with that compact-based um, structural deficit. And that's a, that's a really important thing. But I really want to sort of address most of my comments to the other part of that, uh, which is the U.S.-Mexican par part of it. Huh? Um, and, uh, I'm going to, to both agree and disagree with John uh, Ensinger uh, and what he said uh, uh, this, this, this morning. Um, uh, I agree with him that <laughs> on the sustainability issue, we're no, nowhere near sustainability, and, and it seems like it's, a, it, it's just a tall reach to get to any kind of sort of abstracted notion of sustainability as we would think about it if we were thinking about the Brooklyn Report and we were thinking about uh, the... the, the, the uh, the Millennium uh, Goals and, um, and, and such. Um, you know, that, 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 that involves a number of different aspects, economic, environmental, uh, uh, and social. Uh, and we're a long way uh, from, from that. Uh, um, but, uh, but I am optimistic about one uh, important aspect of the U.S.-Mexican relationship, and that is uh, what we have achieved uh, in our uh, treaty. Uh, uh, the 1944 Water Treaty and its aftermath. Uh, um, and this is where I, 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 I'm party, departing company from John, uh, because he said this morning that the, the thing that, that drives him nuts is, is, is uh, Article 10, Section B, uh, that extraordinary drought clause uh, in the 1944 Water Treaty. Um, and. And he's right, it was never defined. And it has perplexed folks ever since. And not just on the Colorado, but on the Rio Bravo, on the Rio Grande. <laughs> uh, it is a perplexing thing. <laughs> um, 
but I'm going to propose to you that it's brilliant. It's just brilliant. Hmm. Uh, and the reason for that is that it creates a kind of dynamic resilience achieved through political negotiations on the river and on the rivers and in our, our, our riparian relationships with Mexico. Uh, we have to negotiate. Uh, and and uh, over the years, uh, we've done that uh, with difficulty uh, and yet success. Uh, we went through a very long protracted conflict over salinity on the Colorado River over 12 years. Uh, and the resolution was majestic. It was absolutely remarkable. And I always tell my students, you couldn't get these kind of deals today. <laughs> you couldn't get the treaty, and you couldn't get Minute 242. Yeah. Impos politically impossible, I think. Uh, but we do have them, and that's important. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, so what, what the treaty has done for us is to give us uh, a negotiating instrument, to, to give us the opportunity to engage. Uh, and that's important because it opens up opportunities that ordinary mortals have to take advantage of, water managers have to take advantage of, that U.S. diplomats have to take advantage of, that people at Department of State, DOI, have to take advantage of. Hmm. Um, it has been difficult. Uh, we haven't always been kind to each other, huh? Mexico and the United States. Mexico has often felt that it was aggrieved. Uh, by the United States. Uh, we're going through a little bit of that right now. Right now yeah? um, uh, and, and so, so uh, pushing things forward politically is, is, is challenging and, and, and difficult, but the opportunity is there. We can do that. We're not fixed to some kind of formula that, uh, that was set back in 1944 that tied each other's uh, hands for perpetuity. <laughs> 1944 Water Treaty, by the way, is for per perpetuity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, so, uh, so, so this is, this is a, an area where I really see a lot of positives. And we've seen that play out uh, in the, the, the last decade, uh, since 2007. Uh, we've seen the development of real um, important and long-lasting uh, uh, initiative that uh, I think uh, results that I think are going to be long lasting uh, on the Colorado River uh, at the binational level. Uh, we've seen uh, new mechanisms uh, being created under the treaty. And as Commissioner Drusina pointed out, these have treaty force. The creation of the Binational Consultative Council has treaty force. That's going to last well beyond uh, Minute 32X. That's going, to, that's going to go forward. That changes things on the river. By the way, that's what we need in, uh, on the Rio Bravo, too. But Texans are an obstreperous lot, and they're, they're, they're finding it hard to, to get to that point in dealing uh, with, with Mexico. They have some legitimate issues, uh, for, for sure. Uh, but they also have the opportunity to negotiate. Hmm. And, and uh, under, uh, under the Article 4 version of extraordinary draft. Um, so, so what I see is that when we look at the treaty, uh, we are making real headway towards sustainability, towards, towards building up the governance institutions that we need to have in order to deal with the other problems that we have on the river and, and certainly to address the, the, the government and contribute to the governance issues uh, that we have uh, here in the, uh, in the area of the compact and, and, uh, and, and in the U.S. side of the uh, the, 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 the basin. So, um, so in, in general, uh, we're, we're, these might be viewed as baby steps, but we are, we are definitely moving forward. And, I, and I'm very optimistic about, uh, about the ability of the treaty uh, to serve our national interests. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. How do we get... Screen. Since I'm a scientist, basically I have to have visuals, otherwise I can't talk. Um, I do want to thank uh, Doug for uh, inviting me. 
And I'm going to say a few words. In some respect, maybe these fit a little bit better with uh, some of the talks tomorrow morning. But I think they do speak to the sustainability issue, just from the physical science and physical uh, hydrology side. So now uh, let's see which one of these advances. The right side. It should be the right click, but nothing's happening. Yeah. Oh, it's here. Oh, I'm sorry. So here's the, here's the problem. Let me go. How do I go backwards now? Okay. All right. The reason is is that these little things are great, except if your eyes aren't good enough to see yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to operate it on my own laptop so I could actually read it as well and make sure we have the same thing. So if you go back about 15 years or so, we were involved in a research project funded by Department of Energy, and Tim Barnett at, at Scripps was the mastermind of that, uh, the intent of which was to try to understand the sort of intersection of climate change with water in the West. And the general design was to look at three large river basins across the West, the uh, Columbia, the Sacramento San Joaquin, and the Colorado. And our charge, and I was then at University of Washington, was to go do some hydrological modeling for each and, and then go do some downscaling and look at what the, the climate scenarios implied. So they came back with the budget, and the budget wasn't as big as what we proposed. So we said, OK, we'll go cut the Colorado River. <laughs> right? and we'll go do the Columbia and the Sacramento San Joaquin. But then a guy named Nicholas Christensen came into my office, and, and he needed a master's thesis. And we said, well, we'll just do the Colorado anyway. So any of you are familiar with the, there's a couple of Christensen papers, 2004 and 2007. Those came out of that work. Okay, so we did all the downscaling and so on, and you know the projected flows went down by varying amounts. So if you fast forwarded then to about 2014 or something, there was a lot of consternation amongst various management agencies, including the Bureau, because our work didn't quite mesh. There was a science paper of Richard Seegers that I think said there'd be 35% decline in the long-term flow of the Colorado. Uh, Marty Hurling had a paper that said 50%. I think we said 11%, and it's like, whoa, why such wide range? So a whole group of us across uh, a set of climate centers in the West got together uh, various luminaries, in, including uh, Brad Udall, Jonathan Overpack, uh, and so on, and, and then my graduate, then graduate student Julie Vano was appointed to basically herd the cats and make something out of all of this. And we wrote this paper in BAMS, which tried to reconcile all of this. And, and it gave four reasons I won't go into for the wide range. Probably the most important one was that the climate scenarios coming out of the IPCC studies that were used in the vis different studies were different. And that you could track most of it back. So the, the message that sort of comes from that, this was all IPCC AR4 stuff, if I remember correctly. Um, every time IPCC comes out with a new set of projections, they're going to be different. Um, they basically all will show things are warming. And I think I can predict the next set of scenarios that will be due out in the next year or two, where AR6 will show that. And they'll have a wide range in precipitation. And somebody will run it through a model, and there will be a wide range of projections. So the, the consistent thing across them is really warming temperatures, precipitation, much less so. OK. I um, guess do I have to point things this way? Why am I not getting action here? Hmm. Uh, could tell, maybe you could just flip it on the screen. That, I'm not quite sure if I'm not aiming this correctly. Oops, Oops there it went. Okay. Um, so we've become more interested because of this whole thing of, you know, you get out of these climate studies, what you put in. We've become more interested recently in what can we understand from going back and diagnosing the past, where at least we have some observations. And we know at least at some level what's happened. So these two plots are for summer and winter temperatures over the upper Colorado River Basin. Uh, summer and winter, 
that correct? Uh, actually, yes, summer and winter. Over the last basically 100 years, they pretty inexorably go up. And if you could read the fine print there, one of them is about 1.4 degrees C and one of them is about 1.7 degrees C. That's a lot, okay? If you go, we've looked at this sort of thing in California and it's about a third to a half is the long-term century trend in, in California. Colorado Basin is really ground zero for this uh, kind of warming. Um, okay, uh, so if you go look at, oh, I've got to remember to do both of these. The stream flow that goes along with that has been going down, also pretty inexorably. Those are naturalized flows at Lee's Ferry, 100 years. And if you see the two colors there and the two dashed lines, one of those is actually a model, a hydrological model, and the other is the Bureau's naturalized flows. They match, at least in terms of the trend, really pretty closely. The reason that's important is it allows us to do some what-if scenarios, and the most important of those has been what happens if we took the temperature trend out, okay? So we, we play a what-if game, take the temperature trend out, what does that mean to the stream flow? So I think I'm too far away from this. Uh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I gotta, so this visual, screen, if it? I could get it to click yeah, again. Hard. Come on, let's go, better. go, go. You're right. <laughs> there we go. I think I have to lift it up. Maybe that's my problem. This I lifted from a paper that came out a few months ago by, by Brad Udall and Jonathan Overpeck. And so the thing we've been interested in doing there is looking at the two droughts, which are the shaded parts they identified this drought, 1953 to 68, and the more current so-called millennial drought. And the thing they noticed is that the stream flow deficits over those two droughts are very similar. But the precipitation, the accumulated precipitation, hardly shows any deficit at all. I think that's the third, uh, uh, third panel down there. And the question is, is this thing being driven primarily by temperature? And oh, to, to go back to the previous comments about the long-term trend, we've run the model simulations, take the long-term trend out, and about half or 60% of the trend goes away if you take the temperature out. And I should also point out that in the long term, the precipitation has not changed very much, very, very small amounts. Those very small amounts actually do make a bit of difference. Um, but, but in the, the, uh, the, the drought, it, it is very interesting that the precipitation deficit is not much. And my theory here seems to be failing. There we go. Um, so another aspect of this that we've been looking at that's really important is where. So if you look at those different colors, Unfortunately, the color bar isn't quite readable, but they are in cubic kilometers. So a cubic kilometer is 1.2 million acre feet. So these are the anomalies for, the, for 2000 to 2014 in temperature, snow water equivalent, and runoff. The distinguishing feature of this, that left panel, all blue, okay? Blue, if you could read that, is about point seven or so of a degree C, 0 .7, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. It turns out, not surprisingly, that is about half the amount of the long-term 100-year trend, mostly because this is relative to the mean, and the mean will come in basically at halfway, right? So, you know, and it's blue everywhere. If you go look at the same plot for that uh, mid-century drought, it's very close to the long-term mean, okay? There's not much temperature signal at all. So there's obviously a big temperature signal. It's the most recent one. And the short version is if we do the same kind of thing and look at the temperature detrend results, we find that about 60% or so of the uh, reduction in flow is attributable to the temperature signal. 
The remainder of it has to do with, and if you look at the middle plot there with SWE and the right-hand one with runoff, there's four or five of these basins which account for most of the trend. Turns out those are the places you really have to look at over the whole Colorado Basin to understand uh, what's, what's been happening. And it's mostly those four up in the northwest part of the basin that, that contribute most of the negative uh, trend. Okay. Uh, the idea here was to go wrap up. Do I have to hold this down longer? Or what do oh, there we go. Okay. So just a few key points. Uh, in both the long-term trend, this ongoing millennial drought warming is accounting for a little over half of the anomaly. Um, there's lots of complications due to summer and winter changes. I'll say just a little bit more about that. But the Udall and Overpeck study suggests that there's some evidence, in, and there's also some work by Connie Woodhouse came out last year along the same lines of control in these droughts between precipitation and temperature. So if you just plot winter precipitation, you, put, you plot annual runoff versus winter precipitation for the upper Colorado River Basin, you get an R squared of like 0.5 or 0.6 or something like that. And you get like a correlation of negative 0.4 or so, which is a you know, R squared of 0.15 or so with the temperature. But that temperature signal appears to be becoming increasingly important. Okay, just a couple of other points to, to wrap up. Okay. Um, you know, basin-wide temperatures have more or less been ex inexorably rising. Uh, the intersection of climate variability uh, and change mostly has to do with runoff volume. Okay, wh so what does this mean? If you compare across other major river basins in the western U.S., so take the Columbia, with, with I'm particularly familiar, the mean annual storage as a fraction of the mean annual runoff is like 30% or something. So management of that system really is all about shaping the seasonal hydrograph. And the volume, if the volume changes a little bit, it's not going to make too much difference. But the warming signal really has to do with earlier snowmelt, and this produces a major stress. The reservoir system is so large in the Colorado that aside from some issues way up in the upper basin where, where there are smaller relative uh, storages, it's mostly about the volume and that sensitivity. So the runoff volume changes, they're still associated mostly with precipitation changes, which as I mentioned, the future are highly uncertain. And warm season warming, and there's actually a paper out there on that, which is a little bit counterintuitive, because most of what we hear is about snowpack changes, uh, which Brad's gonna talk about tomorrow, which is a sort of winter signal, warmer winter temperatures, melts earlier, and so on. But the volume, in some of the experiments we've done, is largely controlled by summer warming and hence evapotranspiration. So it's kind of a timing shift in the winter, a volume shift in, in the summer. And, and then, you know, uh, this business that the spatial disaggregation and, and these five or so headwater basins are really disproportionately important. And we probably tended too much to kind of lump, say, I mean, we understand that the upper basin accounts for 90% or so of the total runoff down at, at Imperial. But even at, at Lee's Ferry in the upper basin, a highly disproportionate amount is, is contributed by a few of these headwater basins. And we really need to understand what's going on up there better. So I'll stop there. Well, thank you all for sticking with us. Um, as Doug mentioned, I'm uh, Allison Harvey Turner. I'm representing the philanthropic community today. I direct the environment program at the SD Bechtel Jr. Foundation, uh, which is a family foundation located in San Francisco. And we seek the pr a productive, vibrant, and sustainable California that is a model of success and a source of innovation. I'm also here representing the Water Funder Initiative, where I chair the funder table. The Water Funder Initiative is a group of nine foundations, including our partners at the Walton Family Foundation, that are working together to identify and activate the most promising 
solutions to water challenges uh, in the West where we think philanthropy can make the biggest difference. I'm here for three reasons. First, as we heard from Jeff Keitlinger earlier today, California's water future relies on a sustainable Colorado River. Uh, second, because the Water Funder Initiative uh, funders have identified the Lower Colorado as one of their top priorities. And third, because Ted Kowalski asked me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so on the net, uh, acknowledging all of the challenges and caveats that we've heard uh, on this panel and throughout the day, um, overall, I see these three pieces of work as an impressively comprehensive framework for progress. Uh, there are few, if any, other similar opportunities in water in the West to make a systemic uh, difference at scale. And I think it's actually this add-up effect that's bringing philanthropy to the table in a new way to the lower Colorado. My one uh, comment, the biggest missing piece that I see and the greatest opportunity I see uh, really echoes Carl's comments, and that is the active inclusion of health, environmental justice, and other local community considerations. I'm mostly thinking about the Salton Sea, but I understand that this is a similar situation elsewhere in the basin, for example, with the Navajo communities and others. Um, I think we heard from Governor Lewis and we saw from Jennifer Pitt some of the opportunities when you engage these local communities. And I think particularly on the Salton Sea, the key to unlocking the funding and the leadership and the urgency that we really need is having a greater community representation uh, and those representatives raising the health risks and sitting alongside us asking for solutions. So with that, I'm going to cede any additional time and turn it to questions. <laughs> it's interesting that, that most of the members of this panel at one time came up to me and said, I don't really fit on this panel. Well, if none of you fit, then you fit perfectly, because that's kind of what the thought here is. Let's think about these issues from a lot of very different directions, and, 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 and you've done that. And between what you've said here and what I've heard today, the two themes that jump out at me are the, these, these, these negotiations we're talking about are all good steps, they're all promising, they're all... Um, making things better than they were. Um, there's a lot of optimism, except if you start talking about the climate trends. And then, <laughs> then we get this issue of, of um, gradual incremental change, um, maybe gets us where we need to be, unless some of these really scary cl climate projections um, are in fact accurate. So that's kind of what I've taken from this. Not that you asked, but that's what I've taken from this. All right, um, but this is time for you to ask questions. So, Sean's back there. Maybe someone who's near Sean would have a question. That would help. <laughs> uh, over here, okay. I, I wanted to uh, ask Larry McDonald about his suggestion. Now. There was a non-incremental change in Australia, which is the federal government after the early 90s injected itself, you know, driven by a sense that the states, because water was a matter of states' rights, uh, but driven by a sense that the states were not uh, being effective. And uh, it had the ability to do this because of another quirk in Australia. Australia had a sense in the late 80s and early 90s of uh, declining into economic backwardness, and it set up a national economic commission, and that led to the formation of a permanent body, the Competition Council. Uh, but it created a lens that uh, the federal government uh, could intervene, for example, in setting urban water prices in an Australian city, or anything, if it was a threat to the national economic competitiveness. Uh, so uh, it, that was a separate initiative, but it made it possible for the federal government to intervene uh, you know, legislatively, uh, but also with money. Uh, here we had a National Water Commission uh, 41 years ago, as I recall. <laughs> as a graduate student, I contributed uh, to it. Uh, but uh, and, and the lot, so there are two things. The, the states in Australia were, were not succeeding, 
and maybe they also didn't have money. And uh, there are some analogies, you know, with the uh, with the U.S. And so my question is: Isn't it, doesn't this require essentially sort of federal uh, level intervention or philanthropic intervention? And uh, the challenge, therefore, is to sort of build a pathway leading to that. All right. Well, that's a very good background. Um, you, you know, the Australia model only goes so far in uh, comparison with what we're doing here in the United States. I think, you know, to give you my impressions, I think we are in much better condition here in the Colorado River Basin. As you heard this morning, we, we have a pretty healthy set of water managers uh, that directly uh, have state support. Uh, there is a, a much greater integration of state and federal and non-NGO uh, interests in the Colorado River Basin, even including Mexico. Um, you know, in many respects, we are far better positioned to deal with these issues. Um, I think the, the reason I wanted to throw the Murray Darling in there is just to show you that, you know, it can be done. There, there is this other path that isn't necessarily in contrast to what we're trying to do, but the concept I think is a good one for us to think a little bit more about, which is, you know, if we are facing an oversubscription of water allocation and use in a basin, doesn't it make sense for us to think about how we might reduce that on a long-term, I mean permanent basis? Uh, and couldn't we at least experiment to see if that is a viable uh, opportunity? Certainly the Australian model indicates that with funding, uh, it worked there. Uh, so I take some encouragement from that example just to say that, you know, apparently th th there are people who have water rights who actually are more than happy to give up those water rights. Not a lot, but some. Uh, and we, we aren't talking about a huge amount of water, but we are talking about enough to try to offset what our, uh, where we are really oversubscribed in the basin, and that has mostly to do, as I said, with evaporation and, and river losses. Uh, the Australian model is, doesn't parallel in, in, in many respects. I mean, I think you know, often people will say, well, that's Australia. They, they are different, and uh, of course they are. <laughs> Uh, but I think the fact that they tried it, it worked, uh, is an indication of something that if we were interested in trying it, we could say, well, you know, apparently it's a possible route. So, so I take heart from the fact that uh, it did work. You're right. It was a nationally driven model. That would not be true here. Uh, but we don't need that here. We really have a, a better, more coordinated, more integrated set of players. I think the combination of which could draw on more resources to make this possible than strictly looking to a federal, um, you know, commitment of, uh, of funds, which I don't think is very likely. Anyone else want to contribute to that question? That answer? Sure. John? I have a question for um, Steve. I was fascinated by your sort of defense of the ambiguity of the language of the 1944 treaty, and I loved your phrase dynamic resilience through negotiation. But you contrasted that with um, the um, problems in the Colorado River Compact with the fixed allocations, but it sounded to me like what um, John Ensminger and the others were discussing this morning in terms of the ongoing negotiations over the drought contingency plan kind of felt like something like that, like what we're seeing now is dynamic resilience through negotiation on the U.S. side of the border and in DCP too. How, how are the? Is, is that? A, am I missing something, or is that a contradiction in what you're saying? Or you know, how do the two things relate to one another? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I think you're you're right, and and uh, and that's that's I think the I think a, a cause for considerable op optimism. I, I just think my my sense is that it has been more more difficult that the the, the, the Believe it or not, I mean, it's hard to negotiate with Mexico. Uh, I mean, uh, for, for any number of reasons, uh, and uh, and and, uh, but it's uh, I think on uh, on the in the U.S. basin states, uh, it, it is it has struck me as so painstaking because of the decentral because all of these individual stakeholder groups have to be. Accommodate, and because of the variation in uh, legitimation or approvals that, that, that that's in place in, in the various states, and and of course the upper basin, the lower lower basin differential, and and, and how that how that works. So the, the, 
when you couple that to the fact that, that everyone among those stakeholder groups is, is just passionately defending their water right, uh, it's, it's more difficult. Mexico actually has more flexibility <laughs> internally uh, to represent the national interest <laughs> at the level of CELA, at the level of, of the, the Mexican section of the International Boundary Water Commission, uh, than the U.S. section. <laughs> the U.S. section uh, has, has had to carefully, um, I think, cajole, <laughs> um, try to lead, but, but, and, and not lead by behind, but, but lead together <laughs> with, with, no, with you know, nobody's in front, <laughs> everybody. And I think in, in, in the past, the states have been very resistive to, to these kinds of, kinds of, uh, of efforts. Uh, I mean, the, the analogous situation is probably the salinity crisis and what, what happened during the salinity uh, uh, crisis where uh, the uh, Committee of 14 was, was resurrected. Now, they weren't in the, in the room per se, but they made, made, their, uh, made their concerns very well known huh? uh, and, in fact, uh, stopped a solution for, for better than a decade mm -hmm. uh, and be, before the, the federal government got, got more involved. And even then... Uh, had to go back and get uh, all of the approvals from the upper basin separately and the lower basin. And, uh, and, and so, uh, so, so when I look at the two sides of the border, I, I, I just see more institutional Im impediments. Uh, you know, they're, they're there for a reason. I'm not, I'm not saying you know, people are not uh, entering into these negotiations in, in good faith. Uh, but, uh, but, but there's, there's definitely greater difficulty to getting to go, <laughs> uh, I think, on the U.S. side than there is on, on, on the Mexican side. When the Mexicans look at these issues, uh, they are looking at, at, uh, at these issues uh, from a more consolidated uh, perspective. <laughs> uh, they, they, they think of them in nationalistic effort. There, there's been a little bit of decentralization going on just recently, since since, uh, since changes in Mexican law in 1992, allowing more individual water rights and this, that, and the other, so you're beginning to see some of these some of the stakeholder dynamics on the Mexican side that you see on the U.S. side. But uh, uh, but but uh, in, in in general, um, I, I I think it's been a, a taller lift on the U.S. side to get to the get to those agreements. The good news is, though, it is happening, and and, and I think as as a number of the commentators this morning pointed out. That the great value here is the experience of doing that huh? and trying to push it forward after 2020, after 2026, and, and keep, keep that going in a way that's compatible with the, uh, with, with the compact and, and also serves the interests of the, the 1944 Water Treaty. So. All right. We'll let Bonnie have it. <laughs> So this question is for Allison, and um, thank you for raising the issue of social justice in your, your brief remarks on what's of interest to the Water Funders Initiative that became so prominent in the conversation in California um, over extended drought that the effects on uh, low-income and minority communities were highly disproportionate. And even if, say, water costs were changing the same percentages in a higher or middle-income community and a low-income, the impact on households is much higher. Um, so in the Colorado Basin, we haven't, we have, I don't feel the same level of awareness of that issue of how water scarcity disproportionately affects different kinds of populations with the exception of the strong leadership in the tribal communities and how they've been affected. I wonder if you have good examples from California on the kinds of work uh, that were funded that were responsive to social justice and water scarcity concerns. So, I mean, it, it, it's hard to imagine that we actually think those issues are have great awareness in California, uh, in spite of the drought and all we've seen. You know, there's at least three times the number of people in California without safe drinking water as there are in Flint and the awareness is actually still much lower. So we have a long way to go. Um, and I think you know, one irony is that 
what caught people's attention was wells going dry and people running out of water. The vast majority of those people didn't have clean water to drink before their wells went dry. Um, so we've, we've been dealing with this problem um, kind of under the radar for quite a while. So I wish I had a lot of great uh, examples of how to do it beyond making sure wells actually go dry. Um, you know, I think you know, the, the primary, the uh, kind of the only solution I can point to is getting the, the voices of those people out in front. I mean, people, you know, took local community members on field trips to Sacramento to, to talk to the legislature, and that sort of thing is what's needed. I, you know, it's, it's harder in the Colorado River because you've got seven states, but um, you ha it has to be in the voice of, of these, the people who are impacted, or, it, you know, if it's someone's water manager speaking about uh, their needs and their ratepayers, it just doesn't have nearly the same impact as the voices of the people who are impacted. So I think that's my, my one piece of advice. Uh, so this question is more for, uh, I guess, Larry and Don. Um, a little bit on what both of you said and a little bit what Steve said on groundwater and just how there's been inconsistencies within the prior appropriation system since its founding because, you know, we didn't account for evaporation and groundwater losses, nor could we really measure them in 1860 accurately. How do you guys think the system is going to change, at least in the upper basin, going forward in regards to how groundwater interacts with, uh, you know, service water. Um, I'm specifically thinking of things like in Douglas County, Sterling's Ranch, and how they had to prove that, you know, their sustainable solutions built into their um, new developments were not actually impacting the Colorado River further downstream, downstream, and just how we're going to be able to legally start accounting for groundwater um, in addition to our surface water management styles? Well, uh, throughout much of the upper basin, we already account for groundwater legally. People have to have a right to use it. They have to get a permit. They have to get uh, a permit to take water out of the ground from a well. And in giving that permit, the state engineers look at the impacts on usually the surrounding groundwater uh, so that it is not adversely impacting other groundwater users. The uh, analysis of potential impact on the, ground, on the Colorado River is also considered in the upper basin because in the upper basin we consider groundwater that ultimately would migrate to the Colorado River to be Colorado River system water. And we count it as part of our system uses. It, just as we would count a direct diversion out of a tributary or out of the main stem. And so our modeling reflects the Colorado River as it exists now, which includes the groundwater contributions already. But so, yes, there's a, uh, maybe some pockets where uh, some additional work needs to be done, but in a large scale in the upper basin, groundwater is heavily regulated, and its uh, effect on the Colorado River is taken into account because it's counted against Colorado River uses if it's in that drainage. Yeah, I agree with Don. And then uh, in the lower basin, the Bureau of Reclamation is who accounts for groundwater uses in the river corridor. So the state laws in the lower basin, California and, and uh, Arizona are not as like ours where we really do pay attention to the surface water groundwater interactions down there. They really don't. But the Bureau has taken it on itself to kind of track all of the wells that exist in the river corridor and to start accounting for the depletions that those wells are causing to the river. So that gets charged to the states. <clears throat> so it doesn't regulate it, but at least it's being counted. I have a different groundwater question. It, uh, the NASA graphometric studies of the upper Colorado River Basin indicate that the uh, groundwater there has been severely depleted, which kinds of, kind of indicates that a lot of the uh, deliveries that we've been making to the lower basin states have actually been coming out of groundwater. So how are those arithmetic adjustments going to change our issues with, with the law of the river? Who's that? 
<laughs> no one wants yep, to. I'm asking, <laughs> I'm asking who that's for, but uh, uh, the, there's no question that 17 years of drought uh, significantly impacts groundwater. Uh, the groundwater elevations have fallen in many places, in addition to the usage that further impacts groundwater. Uh, we think that the groundwater contribution, that contribution that was quantified by USGS, uh, as apart from that which runs into the river via the surface, that which runs in underground via channels, is adequately represented in the measurements of in-stream flow and the modeling that we have. That modeling reflects the groundwater contribution as well as the surface water contribution. So, uh, yes, uh, drought and depleted groundwater, just as well as uh, depleted surface water, can impact the ability to release. But uh, it's all accounted for in the river itself and the, the deliveries that go to, to the lower basin. And so, we're not so concerned, I guess, as to its source. Uh, groundwater traditionally has been more of a concern in the local area. When somebody puts in a new well and causes the neighbor's well, it's only so deep to go dry because it, the groundwater table dropped, has been the, the big issues. But I think with our modeling, incorporating whatever the groundwater is doing, uh, I don't see a, a change in the allocation. The loss of groundwater supply and the loss of surface water both will affect our ability to meet compact obligations. Uh, Carl and, and others, um, I guess a very short question and then I'll expand it a little bit. The little short question is, do you think that the science that's going on in the Delta is going to yield a number, which is how much water does the delta need? Now, the, the expanded question is, I could imagine in this wor water short world that we live in and it's only going to get worse, that in a world of infinite science, we would be looking and water developers would want to know what is the sweet spot. What is just enough water to get the maximum environmental gain? And then above that point, well, the, there's a diminishing rate of return. And what is that sweet spot? So that's a longer question. And then listening to some of the talks, I'm not sure whether I really get the impression that the amount of water needed to restore the delta is simply limited by how much of the delta is farmed to remove the non-natives, create cottonwood plantations such that you'll take any amount of water and there is no upper limit and it's really all a matter of the political negotiation. So I guess that's, that's my question. Do you think the science is gonna yield a, how much water do you really need? Do you think the science is going to yield, if you give us this much, this is where we can do the most good with the least amount of water, which is a reasonable question for the development community to ask, or do you think, in fact, it's always going to be, we'll take whatever amount of water the political process will give us, period, and then we'll just farm it and make the most of that? How do you think it's all going to play out? That was a single question, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, the first uh, the answer to the first question, which I've been asked before, how much water does the delta need? Um, I've answered uh, that sort of. That I'll, I'll, I'll pose a question in return: How much nature do you want? You know, in a sense that that's that in itself is a values question or a political question. Um, is there scientific knowledge at work uh, that say determines? How, my, how many hectares of cotton willow habitat uh, you can create per you know, acre foot or cubic meter of water in a given place? The answer is yes. I mean, this is some of the knowledge that's being generated by the conservation groups uh, as they restore some of these places. Now, they're going for the low-hanging fruit, of course. Uh, they're going for places where the water table is already high, uh, where there is proximity uh, to irrigation water. So, you know, that's, that's a sensible thing to do. Um, 
So, in, it, so the part of this, the second question is the science adequate for that? I think it's pretty damn good. Uh, it matches up, for example, with some of the uh, science that's come out of the MSCP in terms of the amount of water you need to restore a particular habitat. You know, additional sort of science questions would be, well, okay, that's one habitat. What does it take to restore some, to restore some of the uh, upland Palo Verde mesquite? Or what does it take to restore some of the emergent vegetation of, of, of cattails and such? Yeah, those numbers, those numbers are emerging, and, they're, and, and, I, and I have a lot of confidence in those numbers. Now, if, if you were in the delta and interested in restoring the delta, wouldn't you say, sure, give us all the water you got? Uh, you know, it really depends upon the landscape and how much sort of work you want to put into it. But I think the science is, is pretty darn good. You guys look tired. Mm. All right, I, we, we will take one more question. Before we do, let me say that it, we're at 4.45, and I put that in the agenda as when we would stop. I did the agenda before I realized that there was a reception that we could crash that starts at 5. So we, so we could tough it out and go 15 more. Uh, ask a question that requires a, maybe a 15-minute answer. And we'll get to it. <laughs> um, but you guys look tired, so we will do one more. And if you want to talk for another 15 minutes, then I'll encourage you to come up here and talk to people directly. But let's do one more. Oh, well, thanks, Doug. Now I feel like going <laughs> yeah. to get a drink, and I don't feel like answering the question anymore. Yeah. But one of the, one of the uh, concepts that, that's been proposed uh, in connection with re-regulation of the river is to fill Mead first rather than fill partially fill both Mead and Powell. And I wonder if Dennis and others can talk about whether that makes sense as an environmental and hydrologic matter and as practical, as, as feasible as a practical matter. I will warn you, there will be a presentation tomorrow by, by Jack that will cover that pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think Jack's going to talk about that tomorrow. I mean, the short version is presumably the rationale is uh, that higher evaporative losses in Mead than, than in Powell, so it makes more sense to store the water further upstream. But uh, I think Jack is going to talk about that from the limited discussion I had with him. He may not entirely agree, so... Maybe that discussion should be deferred. Yeah, let's don't steal Jack's thunder on this. We'll, we'll, let, we'll let Jack explain that tomorrow. All right, I guess I made you a promise that you could go home now. So uh, um, I'm going to hang around and, and wait for the reception to get going. Maybe it's already started. But for All right, 8 o'clock tomorrow. Key, we start with a keynote address, so... Don't be late. We still have someone's room key here. All right. Who wants to do a road trip and crash someone's room? Yeah, no. It's actually the room key. room key. If I see the room, I'll tell you if it's loading.